Russia, Iran, Israel, and the United States. Now, as you'll find out, it won't take me very long to deal with the United States <laughs> later on towards the end of our talk. But we will be spending a lot of time on Russia uh, and Israel uh, and Iran. We will see how that comes out as we proceed. But so, we're going to start, obviously, with Russia, because Russia is the, the first nation mentioned in the title of this address. And so Ezekiel chapter 38 speaks about Russia. The Bible actually names Russia in the latter days. I'll put up two translations. Rotherham is a very literal translation. The Amplified is, as it says, Amplified. Both of them will tell us the same thing. They will tell us that if you read the King James Version and it says uh, something that doesn't include the name Rosh, the translators didn't quite get that right. But Rotherham's does points out that there's a name here, and the name is Rosh. And that verse, Ezekiel 38 verse 2 says, Son of man, set thy face against Gog, of the land of Mago, prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. And the Amplified Bible is very similar. It says, Son of man, set your face against Gog, of the land of Mago, the prince of Rosh, of Meshach, and Tubal, and prophesy against him. Now I want to demonstrate that this actually is a latter day prophecy. There are those who would say, well, Ezekiel 38 could have been fulfilled in the past. Not so, because you read it in Ezekiel chapter 38, and at verse 8, the timing of this prophecy. And it tells us this in that 8th verse of Ezekiel 38. After many days, thou, he's talking to go, this power of Russia that's the subject of verse 2, shall be visited in the latter years. And that phrase is normally used of our times. I want to demonstrate that that is the case here. In the Latin years, thou shalt come into the land that is brought back from the sword and is gathered out of many people against the mountains of Israel, which have always been waste, etc. Now, it is a simple fact of history that there has been no nation called Israel since 722 BC until 1948, which was the year before I was born. So it's reasonably recent history. Okay. There has been no nation. Oh, you've been Jews in the land. There was the land of Judea that the Romans ruled. It was the remnants of Judah that came back in Babylon. Uh, 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 536 BC, under the guidance of Cyrus, appointed by God to return into the land. But never has that land been known as Israel since 722 BC. So this is telling us something. It's telling us that this land, this, this people, have been brought back from the sword. Okay, so they've been brought back from captivity. And now their land is called Israel. And this power described in verse 2 is going to come down upon the mountains of Israel. So we know that this is a latter day prophecy. It's not being fulfilled, but it's about to be fulfilled. So who is this Rosh that we saw in verse 2 of Ezekiel 38? The celebrated Bokar wrote in 1640, in his sacred geography, that Ross or Rosh is the most ancient name under which history makes mention of the name of Russia. This is what he wrote. You can see it there in the yellow. It is credible that from Ross and Meshech, that is the Rossoi and the Mosque, of whom Ezekiel speaks, descended the Russians and Muscovites, nations of the greatest celebrity in European city. Now you can add to that many commentators, and one of those is Edward Gibbon, who wrote, of course, the decline and fall of the Roman Empire, and he wrote, among the Greeks, the national appellation or name, Russians, had a singular form, Ros. There can't be any doubt that the Rosh of Ezekiel chapter 38 and verse 2 of 39 verse 1 is actually a reference to latter-day Russia. And so the Bible does speak about Russia and its future. We want to talk a bit about what's going on today and what is going to happen tomorrow, according to Bible prophecy. But you might have seen the name Go in Ezekiel 38 verse 2. So who is this Go? Well, if you look it up in the lexicons, Go means, as a Hebrew word, it means a roof. The one at the top, this comes from the English and Hebrew Bible students can call it. So here is a dominating power. This is a reference not to a nation, but to the leader 
of a confederacy of nations who has dominating power. He's an umbrella power, you might say, over many peoples. He sits like a roof at the top of an organisation. That organisation is currently being constructed, we believe. Now, this is not my commentary, this is the commentary of Unger, who wrote his Bible dictionary in the 19th century, so it's a long time ago. And he said, Ezekiel 38 and 39, which deal with Go the Prince, so he identifies this as a dictator, and Mago his land, remember it said, of the land of Mago, and we'll point out what that is in a moment, described the actual invasion of Palestine. Now, yes, the land of Israel as it is today was known as Palestine in the 19th century. It didn't change its name until 1948. So he calls it Palestine, quite rightly so at his time. The actual invasion of Palestine by a great northern confederacy ostensibly headed up by Russia. And of course he comes to that conclusion because he's identified who Rosh is. See, so he's got that right too. The scene depicts this as a gigantic outburst of anti-Semitism, which you'll know by reports in our news programs, is on the increase in Europe and in Russia, dramatically on the increase. This gigantic outburst of anti-Semitism and a colossal attempt to overrun Palestine, that's called Israel, and annihilate the Jew. So Unger got that right when he looked at Ezekiel chapter 38. So when you go to Russia today and you follow around the official government vehicles, guess what you see? Here is a, a license plate of a Russian government vehicle. And I see the letters here, uh, US. Not surprisingly, of course. Russ, right? Rosh. There's the name for all to see. So where is the land of Mago from which this go emanates? Well, that's the land of Mago there. You can see, of course, we have over here, we've got Western Europe. And this red line basically surrounds the area that historians will tell us was inhabited by the Magu. So the Magagites went to this area. Now it just so happens that one of the countries that belongs to the land of Mago is a country called Ukraine. And Ukraine, of course, you're very well aware, is in big trouble right now. And it's in big trouble because Vladimir Putin, who is, by the way, a dictator that we haven't seen the like of for a long, long time, perhaps since Hitler or Stalin, all right, he's a dictator of that ilk. Vladimir Putin has set his sights on the acquisition of Ukraine. You understand why he would do that? Well, you see, it's very, very important to Russians, especially if you're trying to rebuild a Russian empire, which is what uh, Putin is doing. And this is all in accordance with what the Bible requires in the latter days. So a brief look at the history of Ukraine. The Rus, that's the ones you saw on the number plate, remember? The Rus actually, in AD 862, so it's a long time ago, first established Kiev as the capital of the land of the Rus. So Moscow was not the first capital of the Russian Empire. When the Russian nation was formed and its empire began to develop, Kiev was its capital. Now, I think you know where Kiev is. It's been in the strife, hasn't it, in recent times. Kiev is the capital of the Ukraine. The Ukraine is actually the heartland of the original Russia. And that's why Putin wants it. And he's going to get it eventually, and he's tried for a long time. He came to power in 2000. There was an election in the Ukraine in 2004. They elected a, a European Union inclined president called Viktor Yushchenko. In fa actual fact, he appeared on the, on the victory uh, platform with a pockmarked face because the KGB had arranged to poison him during the election campaign. The KGB, FSB as they're now called, but the same thing, were there in force to ensure that Putin's man Yanukovych won the election, but it didn't happen that way. And Yanukovych lost the election, and it was called the Orange Revolution. Well, Putin's ally was defeated, and Putin was humiliated, and I could have shown you a photo of his face on the day when that election was lost. He was bitter and vengeful. I've never seen a more humiliated face on a man than I saw on the face, the visage of Vladimir Putin. Well, he responded. On the 1st of January 2006, in the middle of one of the worst winters that they had experienced in a long, long time in the Ukraine, 
He cut off the gas supply to that country and they began to, fro to, to freeze to death. And it wasn't very long before the situation changed. Um, uh, Yukashenko was made prime minister. Uh, Yanukovych was made president. No, sorry, the other way around. Yanukovych was made prime minister and given effective power to run the country, not the president. So Putin had his hand firmly on the Ukraine. So what's he doing now? Well, he's now supplying weapons and sometimes soldiers to support the separatists in the east of the Ukraine. He's setting out to bankrupt, to totally bankrupt that country. So things are changing there in Ukraine and they're going to go on changing. And here are some commentators who know a bit about the Ukraine. Andrew Wilson, author of The Ukraine's Orange Revolution, uh, writing in, his, uh, in The Independent, on the 23rd of February 2014 said, a real democracy in Ukraine is an existential threat to the entire system that Vladimir Putin has built since the year 2000. Another gentleman who was in fact the first post-Soviet president of the Ukraine said in 2014, Russia understanding that without Ukraine, it would not be able to take its place in the wider arena of Europe and create a new powerful structure that could counterbalance the United States and others, and this is Russia's goal, made a strategic <coughs> decision to keep Ukraine in its embrace. So no wonder that the things that we are seeing uh, on our news programs going on in Ukraine are happening because it actually is required by Bible prophecy. Russia will eventually take control of the Ukraine. They will have their heartland back and Putin will continue to build his empire. We've got some uh, visitors coming in here. Putin will continue to build his empire uh, so that Ezekiel 38 will be fulfilled. He will have his great confederacy and Gog will be of the land of Magog. All right? So there we will have a wonderful fulfillment of prophecy. So why is the Ukraine so important apart from that fact? Apart from the fact that it is an essential part of the original Russian Empire, well, it's because, of course, of the, the Black Sea Fleet and the Mediterranean Fleet. Now, when Ukraine became an independent country, Russia leased the port of Sevastopol from the Ukrainians. They were paying a lease year by year. Sevastopol is critical to the Russian Navy. In fact, it is the command centre for their Black Sea Fleet and for their entire Mediterranean fleet. So, Putin, when he felt that Ukraine was moving towards Europe, thought, well, we're going to lose Sebastopol. That would have been absolutely devastating uh, for Russian policy in the Middle East. That was his dilemma. Now, Russia has actually built, with its own money, the port of Tartus in Syria. In fact, at the height of that building project, there were 50,000 Russians in that area of Syria. They had to take most of them out, of course, because of the current problems in Syria. But they don't want to lose that port. They spend a lot of money. And they have another port to the north called Latakia, which is also basically Russian control. And they have 11 brand new warships. They say, armed with weapons that the Americans don't yet know anything about, and one day will find out to their cost, all right? These 11 brand new warships are, are harboured in these two ports of Tarpus and Latakia. We'll point out the reason why that's happening in a moment. So the loss of Sevastopol, Russia's only warm water port, would have been catastrophic for its Mediterranean fleet. So the Ukraine and Syria are strategically linked in the Russian mind, and both are extremely vital for their national security interests. That's why Putin assumed control of Sevastopol, the Crimea, you remember, in March 2014, I think it was, not that long ago, assumed control of the Crimea. And they held a fake election to prove that it was all part of the, people, the will of the people. So here we've got the situation. So there's your port of Latakia. This is the port of Tartus. I actually stood and looked down on that from about 30 miles away. It's all Russian, basically, and they have an enormous number of very modern ships sitting there. Syria, of course, is in deep trouble at the moment, and things have to happen there, and I'll tell you in a moment what the Bible says about what will happen there. 
So why, why is this the case? Why does Russia want ships just to the north of the country of Israel? Well, in Daniel chapter 11 and verse 40, we read this. And the king of the north shall come against him. I'm going to talk about this king of the north in a moment. Like a whirlwind. Now the him here is the power occupying the city once called Constantinople. It's now known as Istanbul. All right. So he'll come against him, the Turks, like a whirlwind, with chariots and with horsemen, and with many ships. Some of those ships will be in the Black Sea, but most of them will be in the Mediterranean, in the ports just to the north of Israel. He says he shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over. A bit more in a moment about Daniel chapter 11. But let's just step back to Ezekiel for a while. Because we're told about this power, this Gog, the dictator, who puts together a confederacy of nations. And then we're told who some of those nations are. For example, the very first name in verse 5 is Persia. Now the Persia here, of course, is not the Iran of today. It includes the Iran of today. But it's a much wider territory than that. This is Ezekiel writing. And when, when Ezekiel was writing, of course, it was the time when the Persians were, were coming uh, to the fore. And eventually, in 539, they took over the, the kingdom of Babylon and extended their power mightily. And so Persia is a much bigger piece of land. I want to show you in a moment what the territory is. It's described here as Persia. Ethiopia is actually mainly Sudan today, and of course Libya is the Libya of today. And we're going to read about Goma. It says, Goma and all his men. So who's this Goma? Well, we're told by Josephus that the Galatians or Gauls migrated west to France, Holland, Belgium, and other countries of what we would call Western Europe today. So they came from the area of Galatia, and they moved westward and inhabited the area known as Gaul in Roman times, for example. So these, this, this is, we believe, Goma. It's about Western Europe. Western Europe is progressively, of course, coming under the influence of Russia because of oil and gas, etc. And they will eventually be under the total control of Russia. But then we read about the house of Togomar, on the north quarters. Now, north quarters here is due north of Israel. Okay? So you go due north of Israel, where do you come? Well, eastern Turkey, for example. You come to Armenia. You go further north, you come to Georgia. And you know what's been happening in Georgia. So, this is the territory which is described as Togoma. If you go back into history, this is what we read, Keel and Davidish in their commentary on the Bible make this comment. Togoma is the name of the Armenians who are still called the House of Thorgum or Torgomazi today. Okay, so this is the territories due north of Israel, they will be part of the Russian Confederacy. And of course it was in 2008 during the Olympic Games that Putin moved his troops into Ossetia and another province of Georgia. And he ain't going to let go. And he's also in recent years made an alliance with Armenia and is supplying Armenia with weapons. And Armenia of course has a beef with Turkey because of the 1919 genocide that occurred when millions of Armenians were slaughtered by the Turks. So you see, Putin's got a, a real ally in the Armenians. They don't like Turkey very much at all. But it goes on to say this about Go. Be thou prepared and prepare for thyself, thou and all thy company that are assembled unto thee, and be thou a guard unto them. And so what kind of guard? Like the security guard I just saw out here walking up down, uh, and down a corridor? No. This is a Hebrew word that means the guard of a prison. Jesenia says a custodian. This is a power that locks people up in its embrace and will not let them go. That's what this dictator will do for the countries who become part of its confederacy of peoples. He will not let them go. You need to read Habakkuk chapter 2 to know the truth of that. Habakkuk 2 describes the character of this dictator and it tells us that he's one who locks people up under his control. So let's just step back and have a look and ask the question, what does Ezekiel 38 require? Now we haven't read this this afternoon, but many of you will be familiar with it. I'm going to give you a few dot points as to what this chapter requires. It's a very important chapter in Bible prophecy. It tells us, as we've already pointed out, that a dictator called Gog will dominate the Eurasian, that's Europe and Asia, the Eurasian continent. 
It tells us that the territory east and north of Israel will come under Gogian control. They're the powers that were mentioned in verses 5 and 6. It tells us that a dependent Europe will fall under Gog's political control. Won't need, won't need conquest, they will fall eventually under, under Russia's control because of their needs for oil and gas, and they'll also be bankrupt. Most, many of them are now. The West Bank, it tells us in verse 8, will become part of Israel proper. So the world is talking about a Palestinian state. The Pope says that the Palestinians should have a state. President Obama says they should have a Pal Palestinian state on the West Bank. It's not going to happen. The Bible says it's not going to happen. The West Bank is going to be controlled by Israel. It will become part of the territory of Israel. You know how we can be confident about that? Well, 90% of the mountains of Israel happen to belong in the West Bank. They run from Hebron to Mount Gilboa. 90% and go comes down upon the mountains of Israel, not the mountains of Palestine. All right? So the Bible is clear about that. Israel will take control of the West Bank in due course. And I'll explain to you a little later on how that will come about, we believe. Verses 8 to 11 also require that Israel will be at peace internally and with near neighbours. And they're not in that situation today. They have Hezbollah breathing down their neck from the north, they have Hamas troubling them. Uh, in the southwest, they have the Syrian crisis going on on the northeastern border, with Hezbollah supporting you know, uh, uh, Assad at the moment. So there's all sorts of problems. And just a bit further east, they've got Iran, who's manufacturing a nuclear weapon to do as what uh, Amenajad said, wipe Israel off the map. So Israel's not at peace today. I'll show you in a moment how that peace will come. Israel will also be very prosperous, we are told in Ezekiel 38. They're one of the most prosperous nations on the earth today. Now, that wasn't the case just 15 or 20 years ago. But you see, God puts the right people in the positions that he needs them at the right time. And he put, of course, the current Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu in power, who was diverse in the extreme from the former Prime Ministers, who knew nothing about running an economy. But he's an MBA. He knows a bit about running an economy. And one of the first things he did as finance minister in 2003 and 4 was to introduce legislation to bring in to Israel the financial system, the framework that is used by countries like Australia and Canada, who, by the way, survived the 2007-8 financial crisis, the best of all countries on earth. I'm not boasting, I do come from Australia, but we do have a pretty decent financial system, and that's what was introduced into Israel. Britain will be allied with the former colonies and the Arabian Peninsula states in opposition to go. So there will be opposition to go, but it won't be terribly effective. Uh, they're going to be defeated uh, in the land of Israel by go in due course. So this is what we read in the prophecies. And there are several prophecies, all of which are intertwined here. There's Ezekiel 38, which we've referred to at some length. Zechariah 14, which speaks of the very same thing. Joel chapter 3 and Daniel chapter 11, the latter portion of it, all speak of these events. All nations being drawn to Jerusalem, and of course you've got your southern confederacy down here, your Tarshish confederacy, and you've got these red arrows from all points of the compass, which see this massive confederacy that's been put together by Gog, by Russia, coming down upon the mountains of Israel. There to be destroyed by the intervention of Christ and his glorified saints. So it's what the Bible calls for Armageddon. Now Armageddon is not a nuclear holocaust, of course. It's actually a battle in the land of Israel. We're told that in Revelation 16, verse 16. So he brought them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon, which happens to mean a heap of sheaves in a valley for judgment. Okay? And that's what's going to happen to these nations. I want to just step to one side for a second, because I want to now enter into this matter of how peace will come to the Middle East and how the Syrian crisis will be solved and who's going to solve it. Now, as you can see, we ask the question down here, is ISIS suicidal? Well, back in September 2014, you would think so, because we read this, this is reported in American newspapers on the 3rd of September 2014. 
Vladimir Putin was directly and personally threatened by extremist Islamic terror group ISIS. Now, I would have thought that that's not all that sensible, knowing Vladimir Putin. Because, as I say, because of his close ties to Syrian leader Bashar Hafez al-Assad, ISIS, notice this, ISIS aims to liberate Chechnya and the Caucasus. Now, the Caucasus, of course, run up through the middle of Russia. And actually also said they want to take Moscow. So you see, who's the next weapon against ISIS? Well, clearly, Russia. The Russian president, Putin, discussed with his Security Council on Monday potentially contributing to fighting ISIS. The United States has been trying to build a broad coalition to thwart ISIS militants and not doing all that great a job. You know, and a bit of success here and there. And all right, but Russia has not been part of the conversation. And this is what they said six months or so ago. The anti-ISIL coalition is not a club party. We do not expect any invitations, and we are not going to buy entry tickets. You know what they, that tells me? They'll do the job themselves. Not only part of a mishmash of countries who don't know what they're doing, they'll do the job themselves. And the Bible says they will. I want to spend a little bit of time telling you about that. Just finishing off this NBC News article, 23rd of September. ISIS could potentially threaten Moscow directly too. The group's ranks include Muslims from Russia's North Caucasus region who have been waging their own insurgency in the mountainous region following two wars between Moscow and separatists in Chechnya. Well, back in 2004, this agreement called the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, the SCO, was formed by five nations. Now this blue area here, you see, the blue shows the five nations of the SCO. They are China, Russia, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, and Tajikistan, the Stan states, as we call them. Now the green are observer nations. So you've got Mongolia, India, um, this would be uh, Iran, and portion of Iraq, etc. You've got Pakistan. So these are observer nations who may well, well end up joining this particular organisation. So what was it set up? Well, it was set up to safeguard national borders. So if ISIS establishes some kind of caliphate, which is what they want to establish, and then proceeds to cross the borders into Russian territory, Russia simply calls on its fellow partners in the SCO and they clobber them. All right, they'll clobber them. And that's what is going to happen. Form the protection of national borders. Well, Daniel 7, verse 7, tells us something very important about what's going to happen in this region. It says this, it's talking about the fourth beast, and there are four beasts in the first seven verses, Daniel chapter 7, that line up with the four parts of Nebuchadnezzar's image in Daniel chapter 2. This fourth one, of course, is the Roman Empire. Now, the Roman Empire is long since gone, but in actual fact, it has to exist again. Because in Daniel chapter 7, we read, in verse 11, that Christ is going to destroy it. Now, you can't destroy something that's not there. So it actually has to exist again, and it's actually now in the process of being developed. When this great crash comes, I'll talk about later, this great depression which is hanging over the world finally comes, and it's overdue, the European nations, most of whom, the southern ones at least, are bankrupt already, are going to have to go cap in hand to others to support them. One of those will be the papacy, the Pope. And we will have no longer a European Union. We will have ten bankrupt nations dependent nations who will all be south of the Rhine and the Danube. Have a look at an old map of the Roman Empire to where it reached. Well, they crossed the Rhine briefly but pushed back. The border of the Roman Empire for hundreds of years until its dissolution was the Rhine and the Danube. We're going to get the Roman Empire back again. And it has to be back because Christ and the saints will have to destroy it. And it also has a job to do that the Roman Empire didn't do in the past. So this is the description. It says this. After this, I saw in the night visions, behold, a fourth beast, the Roman Empire. 
dreadful and terrible, which it was in its history, strong exceedingly, no could resist it. It had great iron teeth, iron is the identifier, iron was the symbol of Rome. It, what do you do with teeth, by the way? Well, you devour. It devoured and broke in pieces, and it did that, didn't it? But only in the West. It didn't do it in another very important area. That's why you had in the green these words, and stamp the residue with the feet of it. So what does that mean? What's the residue here? Can we identify this? Well, yes, we can. we just got to look at the map of these ancient empires. So here we've got the Babylonian, started by Nimrod, way back in 2240 BC, ended up being destroyed by Cyrus in 539 BC. This was the extent of Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom. All right? Well, it wasn't all that big, was it, really? Well, the, the Persians came along, and their territory was massive. Right over here, they got into Macedonia, right over to Pakistan and India, right into Egypt. Massive territory. Well, look, along came Alexander the Great in 334 BC and cleaned them up. He devoured their empire. And of course, it was basically the same territory, wasn't it? Right over to the Indus River, it's as far as he got. It included Afghanistan, by the way, called Bactria in those times. So this was the territory of the Greek Empire. And then along came the Romans. And the Romans, for a little while, got down the head of the head of the Persian Gulf. <coughs> but they couldn't hold it. An emperor even got killed trying to hold this territory from the Parthians, who were quite a strong empire at the time. So they were pushed back. And in 118 AD, Hadrian sensibly called the Roman forces back to a line that ran north-south through modern Jordan and Syria. Now it actually stood in the Roman force. It had a Roman fort every Roman mile. Stood in four or five of those Roman forts. They're still there. All right. This was the, bound, the eastern boundary of the Roman Empire. So what do you reckon the residue is? If these beasts who fired one another were to devour the former empire, did Rome devour all the territory of the previous empires? No, it didn't. Because you see, it's this territory here. This territory here that belonged to the Babylonians, to the Persians, and to the Greeks. Rome never even got anywhere near it, let alone stamp the residue with the feet. And the last time I stamped on something, it wasn't very comfortable for the victim. So this is not talking about pussyfooting around. Right? Stamping the residue with the feet means you go in with military forces. You put troops on the ground. And they march through the territories. That's exactly what this prophecy requires. There will be Russian military control of the countries embraced by those red lines. And that's the second reference that says that. Daniel chapter 11 verse 40 is the third one. That says exactly the same thing as you'll see in a moment. Now, one would have been enough for me because there's only one place in the Bible that says there will be a thousand year reign of Christ on earth, and that's Revelation 20. And I believe it! But three is more than enough. And we have three references to this happening. And anybody with half an eye watching world events knows that it's progressive towards that very outcome. Right? And ISIS is one of the capitalists. Idiots they are threatening Putin. They establish a caliphate and start transgressing his boundaries. You can tell what's going to happen, can't you? Mm. He's going to come down there and sweep through there and get rid of them. They cut people's heads off. That's pretty general treatment of what he'll give. They'll end up being destroyed. Absolutely. Alright, so that, that is the residue that has to be stemmed by the revived fourth beast of Daniel 7. And who's reviving it? Well, Russia is the power of a little bit today, a lot more tomorrow. When events unfold, as you're going to see a little moment. So what about this here? This is Daniel chapter 11, verse 40. And Daniel 11, 40 actually tells us about the power. We read it a little while ago, didn't we? The king of the north. And if you read the 11th chapter of Daniel, you will know that the king of the north was actually a reference to one division of Alexander's empire that was broken up after his death. It was controlled by one of his senior gen generals called Seleucus. It became known as the Seleucid Empire. And it's the green area here. 
This was the area controlled right over here by a man called Seleucus. The king of the south of Daniel chapter 11 was a man called Ptolemy. And he, another general of Alexander, took over Egypt. And this bluish area here is the area of the kingdom of the Ptolemies. We ruled for quite some time actually in Egypt. So there's the king of the north and here's the king of the south. And of course they used the land of Israel as their tromping ground, as their battle ground. And the whole of Daniel 11 is about that. You know, commentators have said Daniel 11 could not have been written before these events came to pass. It was impossible to be that detailed. Well, the problem for them was that one of the Ptolemies had the Old Testament translated from Hebrew into Greek in 296 BC or thereabouts. And this was a long time before the events came to pass. So you see, yeah, this was a prophecy from God through Daniel, and its detail is astonishing. So if the former has come to pass, the latter will too. And it will be precise, very precise. And it's precise to this point that you cannot be called scripturally the king of the north until you occupy the territory once ruled by the Seleucids. You can't be called the king of the south unless you control Egypt. Now Britain controlled Egypt from the 1880s to the 1950s. It was in that period that the first portion of Daniel 1140 was fulfilled, but they're not there today. There is no king of the south today because there's no controlling power ruling over Egypt, a foreign power ruling over Egypt. But there's about to be a king of the north, a foreign power ruling the territory of the Seleucids, and we've just seen who that is. It's this power called Go, the dictator of Ezekiel 38. He's going to take control of this territory. Daniel 11.40 requires that Russia take control of the Seleucid kingdom. And this has to happen before the invasion of Turkey, before the capture of Constantinople. Because if you, if you do the latter first, you're not the king of the north. To be the king of the north, you have to have the Seleucid kingdom. You can't be called king of the north until you do. So you see, the scripture is extremely precise about the order of events. There's no accident in that, of course, it's written by God. And then will come the invasion to the south. When Gog has finally taken control of Constantinople, then they sweep down like a whirlwind. Remember that passage? Then 1140, they come with what a whirlwind with many ships and they pass over and they come into the countries, or tell us what countries they are. They come down the coastal strip of the land of Israel, but they're heading Egypt. Okay, so that's what Daniel 11 is telling us. It requires that this entire territory. So, how is the Syrian crisis going to be solved? Well, when Russia takes this area from Syria right across to Pakistan. How's the problem with Afghanistan going to be solved when Russia does what it should have done in 1979? They should have learned from the Brits in the 1880s who couldn't control Afghanistan. Nobody except Alexander the Great, even he had trouble, has ever controlled Afghanistan. You know what you've got to do to control Afghanistan? You've got to take the mountain range to the west between Afghanistan and Iran. You've got to take the mountain range to the east between Pakistan and Afghanistan. Then you can cut off their supplies. That didn't happen, did it, in 1979 through 1989? And the Russians lost 50,000 men in Squillions worth of rubles in equipment. They didn't learn the, the lesson of history, but I'm sure that they've rewritten the manuals. And the next time they invade, they won't make the same mistake again. They'll take Iran and they'll take Pakistan, at least portion of it, and that will secure Afghanistan for them. Don't think that they don't have that as an objective. They always have had the objective of controlling Afghanistan. So this is what Daniel 11 verses 40 to 45 is telling us. Russia invades Turkey and drives down into Egypt, coming along the coastal strip of the land of Israel in the process, pushing, of course, the IDF back into the, into the mountains of Israel. And then eventually they're going to come back. We're told in Isaiah 19 verse 4 that Egypt is given over into the hand of a cruel lord. Everything about how the Russians treat their victims, you'll know. 
tidings from the east and north and Pearl returned to Israel, the tidings from the east, the activity of Christ and his saints over here, and of course the activity of the, of the Tarshish or western nations, who having been blocked from coming in through the Mediterranean, will actually come through their allies' territory in the Persian Gulf, and eventually ensconce themselves in and around Jerusalem, only to be defeated by the Russian forces that will return there in power to overthrow them and the IDF. But go is going to meet his end as Ezekiel 38 tells us he will. And that will be at the hands of Christ and his glorified saints, who will arrive at the precise moment to sweep away this oppressor of God's people. Not that they don't deserve to be punished, they do. But they're all also going to be purged by the process, the terrible destruction that will take place in that land, when a massive earthquake will completely reshape not just that land, but the best part of the globe. And every city on earth will be a heap of ruins. Most of those cities will be in the ocean because of tsunamis. You've heard about the, the island uh, off the coast of, of uh, Western Africa that has this huge amount of rock and soil that will fall into the ocean with any real disturbance. Yeah, and it will wipe out New York City. They are, they'll say it will go miles inland that tsunami when it occurs. I stood there and watched this New York City from a distance and created the picture None of those buildings are going to be left. They'll be out in the ocean. Because tsunamis are God's giant vacuum cleaner. They're designed to sweep in, knock pe buildings and stuff over, and then like a vacuum cleaner, they suck it back into the ocean. That's what's going to happen as a result of this great earthquake that will destroy the Gobi Confederacy in the land. And so we'll have this fulfilled. Ezekiel 38, 21 to 23. And I will call for a sword against him throughout all my mountains, saith the Lord God. Every man's sword shall be against his brother. I will plead against him with pestilence and blood. Thus, there's a purpose in this. Thus will I magnify myself and sanctify myself, and I will be known in the eyes of many nations. And they shall know that I am the Lord. So it's about the establishment of the kingdom of God on the ruins of the kingdom of men. And the outcome is glorious. The Lord, we read in Joel 3, 16, said, The Lord shall also roar out of Zion, and utter his voice from Jerusalem, and the heavens and the earth shall shake. There's your great earthquake. Okay. But the Lord will be the hope of his people, and the strength of the children of Israel, those who remain. So shall you know, he says, that I am the Lord your God. He's talking to his own people here. Dwelling in Zion, and he will, because Christ will be there. My holy mountain, not holy at the moment, then shall Jerusalem be holy, and there shall no strangers pass through any more level. There will be the end of armies tromping through the land of Israel and trampling down God's city where he put it down. <coughs> the end of it. Alright, so that's coming. When? Well, very soon. Because this world has a great depression hanging over its head. I'm going to show you a very brief movie clip. It's right? the beginning of a 45-minute TV. Some of you might have seen this. I just want to show you the introduction. You can follow it up later if you wish. I'm getting reports all the time, not just from newspapers and other things, but I'm getting reports from brethren who work in the finance industry. And I used to work in the finance industry. I was with the Reserve Bank of Australia. There's a brother in Sydney who actually works for a ratings agency. So they've got inside information. And he's telling them that's close. And the government of this country knows it's close. Look back at history here. Soaring US debt, what's it, 19 trillion? Something like that. Political gridlock, they can't agree on what they're going to have for lunch in Congress, leave alone how to solve their financial problems. Uh, three or four rounds of quantitative easing, printing money, where you put zeros on the end of your bank balance. I'd love to do that, but it'd be great. Rising interest rates, that's what created the depression of the 1930s rising interest rates, the, the housing bubble burst, all, all sorts of bubbles burst because of rising interest rates. Now, of course, older people, retirees, want higher interest rates, don't they? Because they want better income, but it busts the economy. But that's the way it's heading. The head of your treasury, I forget her name now, she's a lady, all right? She's saying that interest rates have to go up. And they're trying to forestall it, they're trying to sort of take gentle baby steps. They're going to have to go up. When they do, the whole thing will come crashing down. What about European states? Many of them, as I said, are on the verge of bankruptcy. We used to have the pig states, remember me? The pigs, Portugal, Italy, Greece and Spain, 
Well, now we've got more pigs. We've got France, we've got uh, Ireland, we've got Greece, of course, is in there. They're all in strong. So the day will come when the European Union will collapse because the more wealthy northern European countries are sick and tired of supporting the southern bankrupt countries. And so would, would we be. The European Central Bank at the moment is, is in panic mode. They, they are turning to quantitative easing. You're going to follow the American example down the gurgle. Ridiculous. All right? They have lowered interest rates to almost zero, like America. And then they're going to bring in QE. Ridiculous. Because they can't solve their problems. China and Russia have made sure that that is the fate. Because they've signed financial deals in 2014, not only in oil and gas and in military deals, but they've also agreed I mean, you've heard about the Chinese bank, all right? You know what that's about? That's about leaving behind the US dollar as the world's trading currency for oil, gas, and commodities. And if that happens, all of those US dollars that are out there that nations today need to trade in oil and gas are going to be to return to the American Treasury. Yeah, and there's no money. There's no money in the American Treasury, all right? Bankruptcy. Now, you think, well, hang on. Does the US know about this? Well, it just so happens that the US economy is stalled in 2015. You know, what's sort of spluttering along? But it's died. It's now no longer spluttering along. It's tanked. And you know, they tell you that the unemployment rate in America is 9%. Rubbish. More like 23%. At least Spain's honest and will tell you that their unemployment rate's 30%. And they're Youth unemployment is 50%. Right. Now that's the status today. What about tomorrow? Well, listen to this. The world knows a great depression is coming. My name is Steve Myers, and I want to thank you for taking part in this exclusive Monday morning interview with Jim Rickards the financial threat and asymmetric warfare advisor for both the Pentagon and CIA. Recently, all 16 branches of our intelligence community have come together to release a shocking briefing that contained an alarming consensus. These agencies, that include the CIA, FBI, Army, and Navy, they've already begun to estimate the impact of the fall of the dollar as the global reserve currency, and our reign as the world's leading superpower being annihilated in a way equivalent to the end of the British Empire post-World War II. And the end game could be a nightmarish scenario where the world falls into an extended period of global anarchy. Jim Rickards fears he and his colleagues' warnings are being ignored by our political leaders and the Federal Reserve, and we're on the verge of entering the darkest economic period in our nation's history, one that will ignite a 25-year Great Depression. Today we're going to examine everything he's uncovered, because a bedlam could begin within the next six months, which is why every American should hear his warnings before it's too late. You know, that could be bad news, couldn't it? But it's not bad news for Bible believers in the hope of Israel. You know why? Because Christ said that he's going to take his people, his responsible people, away to a place of judgment the day before the collapse comes. Now we can be confident about that. Well, he uses two eras, haven't he? The days of Noah and the days of Lot in Luke 17. So what happened then? He could have chosen any period of judgment. He didn't. He chose Noah and Lot because there was general prosperity. Not everyone was rich, but there was general prosperity. And on this trip, I've been here in the North, in North America, in America for two weeks, two and a half weeks. And several times I've been taken out to restaurants, right? We've had to sit and wait for half an hour to get a table. And I thought America was in trouble. Christ said they will be eating, and he meant restaurant type drinking, <coughs> and drinking, and he meant hotel type drinking, to the day, just like they did in Lot's day and Noah's day. Eating and drinking to the very day that the disaster occurred. And so he plucked Noah out, he put Noah in the ark, God put him in the ark, and then the collapse came. He sent the angels, and he plucked Lot and his family out, and the next, that very morning, the collapse came. All those down, going down to get their latte, 
and in the, in the main street of Sodom, didn't get there. It blew up in their face. That's why they're not going to be interested as to where you and I have been taken. Because they'll all be lining up at the banks, trying to get their money out, and there won't be any money to be got out. But those who are responsible will be in another place, a place of security in the presence of Jesus Christ. So what, how, do, how do depressions occur? Well, we've got history. We can go back to the history. 1929, October, collapse of the stock market in New York. And by 1930, we had a worldwide depression. 25% unemployment in America and in Australia, by the way. It took them 10 years to dig themselves out of that hole, but you only dig yourself out of holes like that with a wall. You've got to put people back to work, and you've got to close a few mouths. So, Second World War closed 60 million mouths. Then it defeated them. Right? And you've got people back to work making and tanks and warships and planes and things to destroy people. That's how you get out of the depression. So, we're overdue. The world is overdue. A huge financial crisis. And it will be 10 years. It might be 25 year depression. It will be a 10 year depression. And there will be a war. And that's the war called in the scripture Armageddon. And this period, from the time that this crash occurs when the responsible debt are taken to Armageddon will be a 10 year period, but it will also be the time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation upon earth. Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. It won't be a pretty time to be living anywhere on earth except in the presence of Christ. So what will that crash trigger? International bankruptcy will force radical and rapid change for our world. Foreign adventures where nations like America are fiddling around in Iraq and Iran and elsewhere will have to come to an end. There won't be any money to sustain an army of any size, let alone the 1.3 million. And that will allow Russian expansionism. It's like John Thomas said in 1848, when people were pointing out to him the poverty of the Russian treasury, he said, well, why did the barbarians invade the Roman Empire? Well, because they were poor. How'd they become rich? Well, they invaded the Roman Empire and took their wealth. Yeah, exactly. It was the incentive that drove the barbarians in the Roman Empire. And so what if Russia suffers like the rest of the world with a depression? It'll be an incentive to do what Putin wants to do, take control. Middle East peace will be achieved because Russia is going to make an agreement with Israel, and the Bible requires that. Prophecy of Isaiah, like and Hosea. There will be an agreement between Russia and Israel. And Russia will say to the Israelis, we'll solve your Iranian problem by taking that entire strip of territory from Syria to Pakistan, and we'll, let, we'll turn a blind eye while you deal with Hezbollah, supported by Iran, by the way, and the Hamas. At the same time, Israel will take control of the West Bank, end of the Palestinian state idea. And we'll have our fulfillment of Ezekiel 38. Peace will descend on the Middle East for a short while. Preparatory to Armageddon. As I said, a group of 10 bankrupt, dependent nations in Europe will emerge under papal influence in southern Europe beneath the Rhine and the Danube, and we'll have our fourth Roman Empire back again. And Israel will remain prosperous and arrogant on the back of huge fines of oil and gas. Now, this is the end of this, of, of this talk. And I said I'd be brief about the US, and I can be brief about the US. Because in 1860, John Thomas was asked a question. He wrote a book called Elpis Israel, which is like a, you know, it's a fundamental work to Christadelphians. He was asked a question as to what place America occupies in Bible prophecy. And so he wrote a response in the Herald of the Kingdom and Age to Come in 1860. Pages 107 and 108, you can go and have a look at it. The destiny of the United States was the heading of this article. By America, in the inquiry, we presume has meant the United States. In reply, we remark that this confederacy is not represented by any prophetic symbols, nor are there any verbal predictions concerning it, after the manner of those concerning Babylon, Persia, Macedonia, Rome, and the Ten Kingdoms, Russia, and so forth. All right? And why is that the case? Well, the country on earth is going to be smashed more than any other when this depression comes, just happens to be 
the United States of America. And they were smashed by the 1930 depression. That's why there was a strong movement in America not to go to war. Charles Lindbergh led the peace movement. Let's not get involved in European conflicts, was the cry of the day. And it wasn't until the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor on the 7th of December 1941 that the Americans were dragged into the Second World War. History will be repeated all over again. And the outcome of that great conflict will be this. Isaiah 11, 9 and 10. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountains, says God, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And in that day, there shall be a root of Jesse, this is the Lord Jesus Christ, which shall stand for an ensign of the peoples, to it shall the Gentiles see, and his breast shall be glorious. I want to talk about that tomorrow, God willing, here in this place at 11 o'clock. So that's the end of my address here this afternoon. I'm happy to take any questions.